Hello, welcome to Hope Church Harrogate's message of the week. If you'd like to connect with us, please head over to hopeharrogate.co.uk forward slash connect. We'd love to hear from you. Um, We are this morning coming close to the end of our series um, on lament. So since the beginning of the year, if you've not been with us, we've been looking at what's called the practice of lament. It's a tool that you find in the Bible Uh, in terms of taking pain and suffering and sorrow to God in prayer. Often we can think God's only interested in what he can get from us, but actually the Christian story is that God cares deeply about us. Uh, He loves us, he loves the best bits about us, and he loves us in our weaknesses too. And uh, Christianity is not a faith that requires us to be strong, is not a faith that requires us to always be doing brilliantly, but at the very center of the Christian faith is Jesus who came, who lived a human life, who suffered, who knows what it is to be rejected, who knows what it is to feel pain, ultimately felt horrendous physical pain and spiritual pain and emotional pain when he died on the cross. Yet that wasn't the end of the story. He rose again on the third day. We're coming up to celebrate that at Easter shortly. And that's the the center of what we believe as a church is that Jesus has changed everything. Because if Jesus can suffer yet come through the other side, so can we, and he will walk through it with us. And uh, this morning, uh, we're going to look at the topic of mental health and faith. And when we were putting this series together, uh, we were like, look, it's great to talk about lament, but we need to be very honest. And I said this from the front at the beginning of the series, although it is okay not to be okay, amen, sometimes it's not okay to not be okay because you need help, amen, amen. Really, we're getting the hang of this. You remember now, right? And, uh, and we said that at the beginning, but what we wanted to do was make sure that we made space to talk about that more fully. There's just a problem, which is that I am a massive beginner in this area. And so as we were talking, how do we do this? We said, you know what? We've got people in this church who have walked this walk, who have given this lots of thought, who are qualified in this area. Let's get them to share because we have a much better chance at learning from them than we will from Adam. Uh, or from Pete, no offense. Uh, and so we, uh, we've lined them up. And so this morning is a little bit different. We've got three interviews. We're going to do one now and then two more once the kids have gone to Hope Kids. Uh, and I am super excited to hear from these three people. All of them are stepping out beyond their comfort zone in a sense. So they're not used to it being at the front with a microphone in front of their face. And so my encouragement to you is, can we be the most encouraging that we can be as they come forward and as they go down again, because we want them to know that they're loved and supported as they're bearing something of their heart before us this morning. Does that sound okay? Excellent. So uh, without any further ado, Brendan is the first person we're interviewing. Brendan, why don't you come on up? There's a microphone for you. Last time we did one of these sort of interview formats, we, uh, we sat down at the front and the big feedback was, Adam, we could see you because you're tall, but we couldn't see Ruth when she sat down next to you, because she's not tall. And Ruth's not here this morning, so I can say that without worrying about offending her. Sandra says that she prefers the term vertically challenged rather than short. So, you know, I'm not saying you're vertically challenged. I'm I'm okay. But for those of you sitting behind tall people, hopefully the little bit of staging gives you some help. So we're going to just take a few minutes to interview Brendan before the kids go out. Brendan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? How do we know you? Where are you now? Because we miss you. Um, Firstly, it's great to be back in Yorkshire. (laughs) Um, So I was living in Harrogate for two years whilst playing for Harrogate Town Football Club. Um, And who we played yesterday, I'm now playing for Walsall. Uh, down in the Midlands, a uh, different part of the country. Um, and yeah, so while I was here for two years, after moving from London to Harrogate, I was looking for a church community and kind of went online, saw hope, and came down and met some amazing people who I still stay in touch with today. So that's, you know, if I haven't met you, it'd be good to meet you today. But if I have, it's good to see you again. Real. And we missed the chance to say goodbye to you properly because it was at the end of obviously the COVID lockdowns and things. So if you missed your chance to say goodbye to Brendan, you can mob him at the end and tell him how much you loved him and and still do. Uh, This morning we're talking about, it's good to dig yourself out of holes, isn't it, of your own making. 
I've, I've so far insulted my friend by calling him short yeah. and told people that they don't love you anymore, but they can tell you that they used to. I love you. It's all right. <laughs> Uh, so this morning we're talking about mental health and faith, Brendan. Why is that something that you're interested in? I think for me it started in my family. So I'm from a big family, one of seven. Um, I've got, yeah, so five boys, two sisters. And just naturally, if, if you are from a big family, that's got its own mental health <laughs> challenges. But um, So loads of personality types, but it gave me a real passion in my family to kind of you know, work out why people feel the way they do. Um, why people go through challenges and struggles. Um, and yeah, that kind of set me off on my journey. And also I've got two close friends who lost someone quite close to them, um, each of them. And interesting that we're doing a lament series, but that really you know, opened my eyes to why it's important to have really good support systems. And even if you're not qualified or you're not, you haven't got the capacity to really help them like you could do if you were professionally trained, you can still be a real support to someone who's lost someone. So that in that period, it really made me be quiet and just listen to people that, that people that I loved that had lost someone. Real. And uh, we've spent quite a lot of time together while you were, were here in Harrogate. And one of the things that I really picked up about you is you have a massive heart for people and to help people, especially in this area, sort of mental health uh, and resilience, and especially in the footballing world. And I guess maybe it's helpful to connect that with how does your faith in Jesus affect your, your big heart to help people, especially in the football world? Yeah, I think, um, so in the football world, part of my journey into football um, is and has involved a lot of disappointment, a lot of things not working out the way I thought they would work out, uh, which comes with the territory if you play football or sport, you know, in the corporate world probably as well, you know, loads of disappointment. I'm probably in family, in all areas of life, but I found it a lot in football. Um, and I now work with young players who have been, you know, let go from clubs who, you know, feel like, Feel, can feel like their life's over, really, that, you know, that's all they, that was their identity. I'm a footballer and I can't do anything else. Um, so it's been helpful, really, to, yeah, help young players and, you know, realise that there's more to life than just kicking the ball around, even though I really enjoy kicking the ball around, <laughs> that, you know, there's, there is more to life than that. Um, and, sorry, remind me of what I was trying to speak on that one. Well, my question was, how does your um, faith create that heart for wanting to help people in football yeah and then where faith has come into it has been there's been two passages actually in my career that have really helped me the first passage has been be anxious for nothing um, and I've really had to take that off the page and apply it to my life that when anxiety comes up in football um, really to kind of lean on my faith in Jesus and just the highs and lows of football that there's been some real good highs there's been promotions scoring some big goals winning some big games and then there's been the lows of, you know, getting injured, not getting a contract that you want, um, having to leave and move areas. Um, so that's been tough. But so that, that passage has been really helpful. And then one that I think really connects to today was there's a passage that says we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. And on my journey where I've been weak, I guess in football, it can be hard at times to show your weakness and to show your vulnerabilities or where things haven't gone as you thought they would go. And having faith in Jesus has really helped me to bring my weaknesses to him and know that it's not a distant God, but a God that can sympathize with some of my weaknesses. So that's really how my faith has kind of been an unstable industry, helped me to remain semi-stable as best I can. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And so a final question would be, um, you've talked about how your faith helped you, I guess, within, within the high pressure, intense world of football and the high pressure, intense part of life for all of us in whichever place we find ourselves. What things have, have you found helpful for taking care of your own mental health or when, when talking with others for taking care of their own mental health as well? Yeah, I'd say it, it does start off as I'm not okay, but I feel like I've expanded my emotional vocabulary to, to be a, not just I'm okay or I'm not feeling great, but when this happened, it made me feel like this and learning how to express myself well. Um, and then people can actually help me where I'm at. And the same with people around me, that they helping them expand their vocabulary around, you know, I'm not okay to what was the trigger point for me? What really made me feel like this? Getting to the root of it. Um, and then knowing that people can then, you know, I know there's counsellors, I feel like there's a counsellor in the room, other counsellors, but I've been on a counselling journey. I've, you know, um, started my studies of counselling and that's really helped me to um, understand 
how I feel. So self-awareness, I'd say. Um, a greater level of self-awareness. Um, and then with all the information that you get around mental health, if you don't have the courage to actually step out and share, um, it can just be information. So taking the information that you hear around, even in church, and, um, and then applying action to that, stepping out, I think really knowing that it does require action. All, all that you hear about is going to require you to take a step. Um, and then the last point I'd say um, would be safe spaces. So I think you can share, but who are you sharing with? Um, that you have the right support systems around you. And I think when I moved to Harrogate, the church was a great support system for me. You know, kept some good relationships. I think on my second Sunday, I went out for lunch, you know, <laughs> with some guys here. And that, that was great for me. Um, so find the right <laughs> safe spaces um, to share how you feel and what's going on for you. Um, and then ultimately that, yeah, when you, are, when you do feel weak, there is a safe space in Jesus. Yeah. Wonderful. Mate, thanks so much for, for coming, for staying over the night to share with us this morning. Why don't we show our appreciation for Brendan? Get your seat if you want, mate. Great to be back. Real. Our second person that we're going to interview this morning is Lucy Gray. Why don't you put your hands together for Lucy? Come on up, Lucy. Join me on the stage. Hello. Can you up? Yeah, it will come. Hello. It will come. Ooh, hello. <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. Lucy, why don't you start by telling everybody here just a little bit about yourself, a bit like Brendan did, so those who don't know you can get to know you. Sure. I'll apologise in advance. I had COVID a while back and I'm still a bit breathless. <laughs> um, I'll try not to breathe too heavy into the mic. Uh, <laughs> I'm Lucy. Uh, I've been at Hope now for over three and a half years, I think. Um, I moved here and um, I studied in Northern Ireland and then got a job uh, here in Harrogate. Um, I'm a dietitian. Um, and then about two years ago, I uh, moved and specialised um, into in the Wakefield uh, in mental health and learning disabilities. Uh, so I'm based out of the psychiatric hospital there. Brilliant. Doesn't that sound like such an important job? <laughs> Don't we have some amazing people in this church who do fantastic jobs? Um, <laughs> but this isn't just a work no. topic for you. Mental health and faith is a live one for you personally. Um, and you know, you're very bravely said you, you're up for sharing this morning. So what's been your personal experience with mental health struggles? Yeah, um, so I have struggled with my mental health probably for about 15 years now, since I was about 11. Um, my diagnoses are depression, anxiety, also PTSD. Um, but they all come with a very wide variety of symptoms at different times. Um, I have at times, um, unfortunately, been suicidal and attempted suicide. Um, that isn't something I'm struggling with right now. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, that is something that I'm susceptible to when I'm unwell. Thanks for your um, bravery and sharing this morning for us. Um, and... As someone who, who hasn't struggled with mental health particularly, um, that can seem like such a different way of life, um, and they sound like quite significant struggles for you. So um, I'm just wondering, how do those struggles that you've had affect everyday life? For people like me who haven't been on a journey like that, could you help us understand how that impacts your life? Yeah, so I find having um, these various mental health illnesses, like having a full-time job, um, I have to do things um, all the time to try and keep myself well. When I'm starting to struggle, I have to try and get myself back on track. Um, called coping mechanisms, which you might have heard flying around. Um, I find that if one thing goes wrong, whether it be a cold or something stressful at work, it kind of impacts everything else. It's like a dominoes. That's what I'm looking for, dominoes. Um, Day to day, it can be anything from just mild anxiety, which I'm sure a lot of people have experienced in the room, um, to completely non-functioning and being stuck in bed. Um, I've had a lot of time off work over the last couple of years just due to the severity and various physical health things as well. Um, I think the hardest thing about managing it on a day-to-day -day basis is how invisible it is um, and the stigma around it. Um, that's why I'm here telling you all about it. <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate that as well. I think, yeah. you know, my, my perspective as a church leader is society as a whole has been pretty rubbish talking about mental health, but it, it's gaining some traction. 
Uh, I think the church in particular has been very poor at talking about topics like this. And when we have, it's kind of been like a theoretical issue. And that's why our, our heart for today was to have real stories so that people we know and love, we can understand how it affects them. And, and again, I'll probably say this after every bit you share, Lucy, but we really do appreciate your, your bravery and sharing with us. Um, Because uh, I guess a bit like what Brendan was saying, one of, the, one of the things we can be scared of is if we open our mouths, how will other people respond? Mm. And so it's really helpful that we keep reinforcing the acceptance and love for people um, as they share about their struggles. Um, you talked about coping mechanisms in your last answer. And when we were talking ahead of today, you said, this is something I wish I'd learned 16 years ago when this first happened for me. And so could you just talk for a few minutes what, what coping mechanisms do you have in your life, what have you found helpful um, for helping with your mental health? Yeah, I mean, anyone that understands this knows that I could write a book on this. <laughs> but um, I think kind of rough categories would fall into, firstly, looking after yourself. So doing things on a daily basis, on a weekly basis that help you stay well, um, avoiding burnout, eating well, exercising, um, all those fun things that we should do. Eating well, obviously, I'm a dietitian, so I have to say that as well. Um, and then... Uh, another category is avoiding doing things that don't help. So obvious things like drinking alcohol, although I thankfully don't drink much alcohol, um, and watching things that are triggering. I'm sure you've heard that word a lot, but just things that remind me of things that are difficult. Um, and then I think the other major is getting help, which I think you'll be hearing a bit more about later. Um, but, you know, things like medication, talking therapy, um, yeah, just learning about it and reaching out. Wonderful. And just for clarity, you've reached out and got help and you've had yes. some of that medical intervention too? Absolutely. Definitely. And you're glad you did? Yes. Um, no amount of willpower or self-help or reading in the world would have made me better. <laughs> um, I tried for a long time. Um, I've had lots of professional help. Um along with other types of help. And it's the only reason I'm here today. Brilliant. It's really important to make that clear, mm. I think, this morning. And, you know, for us, I hope some of us who know you well have known that these have been struggles for you. Others will have only ever really seen you standing on the stage, you know, helping lead the church in worship. <laughs> uh, and, and it can feel like a disconnect, I guess, for some people. Where they go, oh, but I always thought Lucy was sorted because she <laughs> was on the stage. <laughs> um, and so I'm going to take it from there into the question of faith. So, mm -hmm. you know, so you've had these struggles that have affected your day-to-day -day life. You, you've needed medical intervention to help you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and how has your faith helped you or how has it interacted with your mental health through that journey, through those struggles? Yeah. Um, I was a Christian when I was a child. And then at school, I kind of fell away from it as a lot of teenagers can. Um, and then I had quite a severe breakdown at uni when I was about 20 and it got to the point where I was trying medications, I was talking to counsellors, nothing was working um, and I just felt it in me that God, I needed God, it was the only thing that I could do. Um, so I joined a church and felt at home immediately um, and really just needed him every single day, nearly every minute of every day. I was going through stuff at uni things were stressful as life is. And every time I struggled, I just gave it to him. And I said, please keep me walking through this day. Um, and as I said, that is, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't done that at that time. Um, and I think over the years, unfortunately, it hasn't been an easy story of, you know, that happened and I'm healed and I never struggled again. <laughs> Clearly that's not true. Um, but I find that, now when I, I think it's the biggest thing that has an impact on my faith is my mental health. So if I start feeling like I'm getting low, I start kind of what Brandon was talking about, kind of self-awareness, then I immediately think, right, where's God? And I'm praying, I'm listening to music, I'm reading my Bible, I'm attending every church event I can. Um, and that just helps me to refocus on how I got through it and how I continue to do it. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Lucy. It's really helpful. Uh, so final question, just quickly, would be, what would you say to anybody here? Because all these are leading questions, really, to get information out to these beautiful people looking back at us. What, what would you say to someone here who can identify with some of what you're saying about uh, their struggles with mental health? 
Yeah, I think always speak to somebody. Um, going through these things alone is terrifying. Um, being able to have someone, even if they haven't gone through it themselves, just having someone to sound off to, um, you know, as Brandon said, choosing who to trust um, and who to talk to, you know, someone close to you. Um, and, it, you know, they can kind of intercede as well. If you're getting to a point where you really need that help, they can say, you know, hey, <laughs> I think you might need to get some help. Um, and then, again, asking for help. Um, unfortunately, uh, the world we're in isn't quite up to speed with mental health. So I find that a lot of times when I'm struggling, I have to shout for help. Um, things have to get really bad before I get to a point where people can actually help. Um, and it's really important that you do that. And it's the thing that you don't want to do when you're feeling unwell is ask for help, but absolutely do it. Someone can help, even if you feel like they can't. Um, and, you know, I think um, otherwise, just, um, as I said, when I said talk to people, um, anyone's welcome. I'm very open about this, clearly, so I'm happy to talk to people. I find that talking to other people with mental illness who have gone through it and see what treatment options they've had, educating myself on what's out there, because you go to someone and they say, what would help you? And you think, well, I've not a clue. Um, so it's really helpful to have a knowledge of what can help for other people. Um, but yeah, talk to someone that you trust, talk to someone here, ask for prayer, um, we want to journey through this with you. Brilliant. Lucy, thanks so much for sharing that. That's so helpful. And I, I know many people really appreciate it. Thank but you. Has to for Lucy. Yeah. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, ready for another one? Uh, the next person I'm going to invite up is Akin. Why don't you come on up, Akin? Come and join us on our mini stage. If you're new here, we don't often have a stage. It just, but welcome to the stage. Here's your microphone. Grab a seat. Look out at the beautiful people. They're very friendly so far. Hi, everyone. Uh, Akin, why don't you do as Brendan and Lucy have done, just introduce yourself a little bit. People who don't know you, how long have you been at Hope? What do you do when you're not here? My name is Akitunde Akirinola. That's quite a volume. Uh, people call me Akin because my first name starts from Akin and my surname starts from Akin. So you can call me Akin for those <laughs> <laughs> who don't know me yet. Um, I've been a part of Hope uh, since 2019. Uh, we used to live in Manchester with my lovely wife, Uluwa Toi. Uh, people call her Toi, but I call her SH. So if you see me sometimes say SH, that means my sweetheart, my uh, wife. Uh, and we've got three lovely children, Daniel, who some of you know, uh, and then Tiwa and Tife uh, are my children. And um, I'm also a psychiatrist. So as Adam asked, uh, if I'm not here on a Sunday during my week, I work as a psychiatrist. I am one of the old age psychiatrists in the community, and I deal with people uh, who are 65 and above. And if you're not 65 and above, and you have some memory problem, I also deal, deal with the memory service also. Excellent. So you see, we've deliberately asked a range of people to come and share to get the different perspectives. And so we've had Brendan, who's, who's interested in learning from counseling and has helped people. We've had Lucy with her own journey. It's a real joy and a privilege to have Akin, who's qualified as a psychiatrist, given years of his life to learning expertise and does this day in, day out, particularly with people over 65. But for people under 65, what you say counts too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, just, to be, just to be clear, because I don't want you getting out of it. Uh, and so you are both a psychiatrist and a Christian. Uh, do you find there's a tension in that or do those two things help one another? For me, as a person, I think both actually inform each other. I was first a Christian before becoming a psychiatrist. So uh, I, I, on, on a daily basis, when I get to work, the first thing I ask is for Holy Spirit to guide me, you know, as a Christian. And I ask the Holy Spirit, what would you have me do here? So that forms a pivotal uh, principle in my life. 
and it has always helped me to give the best to my patient on a daily basis, you know. So I, I don't think there's a tension between the two of them. They actually uh, feed on each other, being yep. a Christian. Uh, I see myself in my workplace as a psychiatrist, as being in a mission field for God. I see myself as an extension of the hand of God. You know, I see myself as a voice to those who are going through challenges, through difficult time, you know. And like the scripture tells us, Jesus was saying, he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he said, for those who believe, the things that I do, you also do, and even greater work. So I see myself in that field, working for God in his kingdom, looking after his creation, you know. And the word of God tells us in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 38, he said, how God anointed Jesus Christ with Holy Ghost and with power, that he went about doing good, healing those who are oppressed of the devil, you know. So I just feel that as a Christian, I stand more in a vantage position to work as a psychiatrist, as a Christian. Yeah, wonderful. I, I love the way you see that, Akin. And, you know, we were talking beforehand and like, as a church, you can't very easily help people in those situations. But here we have a man who's following Jesus every day, helping people in the way God would want to help people. And uh, and it's thing you were saying to me before, things like being able to bring peace to people, being able to bring help to people mm. is how you see it as the mission field of God. It's, it's not that you're trying to get all your patients to come to church. No, no, no. It's that you're trying to bring the, the goodness of God <laughs> yeah. into their situations. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's so helpful. And it's so helpful for all of us in, in, our, in our work lives, yeah. if for people who have jobs, that, that we see that it isn't what happens here that's the most important thing. It's not that God's only here in this room, but that he's with us in our everyday lives helping us in our work as well. It's so helpful. Thank you. Um, obviously, this morning we're talking about mental health and faith, uh, and you have a, a unique position to be able to, to dispense your wisdom and learning to us. And so if you had to narrow it down and say, these are the big one or two things that you would want to say to people here this morning about mental health and faith from your learning experience, what would they be? Thank you so much, Adam. Uh, for me, and this is to every one of us, mental health is real. Uh, there are a lot of myths out there, and we need to dis demyst demystify all those myths. You know, there are people going through challenges, even as we speak. You know, uh, there are loads of, as I would say, call it... Um, Incidents of problem with mental health issues in UK. I'll give you a bit of statistics so that you will know that these things are real. Uh, as we speak, one in six people in the last one week have gone through or are going through mental health issues. One in six. And there are reports that one in five women go through mental health problems in UK. One in eight men go through mental health problems in the UK. One in eight. That's a staggering figure out of the whole population. So it's as real as the breath that we take these issues. And so we need to take it very seriously. You know, uh, I, I'll give you another statistics. In 2018, when the last... Uh, incident of suicide was recorded just before the coronavirus pandemic. 6,507 people completed suicide. 6,507. And that was a far cry above what we had in 2017. One would then wonder what the figures will be right now after the pandemic or during this pandemic. It's because so many people are going through anxiety issues now depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, psychosis, when people begin to see things or hear voices when, they are, when people are not around or see things when people are not around. So these things are real. And I want to emphasize that the way we treat physical health problems 
is the way we should also treat mental health issues. Because if you've got a broken bone, you don't just sit down and just pray. You go and seek for help. We go and seek for help. Seeking help appropriately, timely, in a timely fashion uh, goes a long way in our recovery process. So let's see mental health issues as the way we see physical health problems. You know, when you, go, when you, when you have a broken bone, you go and see an, an orthopod who is an orthopedic surgeon to fix the bone. You know, when we are going through mental health issues, you know, people go through loads of things. You know, take for example, Adam, you know, things like depression. What are the subtle signs of depression? When you start struggling to sleep, when you start struggling to motivate yourself to do the things that you normally would enjoy, what we call anhedonia, on a daily basis, and it's lingering on for more than two weeks. When you're struggling with your self-esteem, when you're self-suffering with your uh, confidence, you know, when your mood is quite low, when you can't eat, those are subtle signs of the fact that one is going through the line of depression. And like Lucy said, you can try as much as possible to help yourself, but there are also help there that we can avail ourselves of the opportunity of. So let's not suffer in silence. Let's not suffer in silence. There are loads, and we as Christians, we are even at a vantage position as believers. You know, we have this community, you know, the family of God where we can come is a safe place to share with people that you know you can trust. The word is trust. The word is trust. The people that you can trust, you know, we have leaders in the church that you can speak to. You have leaders in your uh, midweek group that you can speak to, you know, because a problem once shared is half solved. Excellent. Thank you. Let's recap because this is this is gold mm. right now. Number one, mental health problem is real, and those statistics are frightening in terms of the mm. prevalence. So yeah. one in six people, even now, even now, struggling. I mean, I, I've heard statistics, but that one just landed for me when we were talking about it before. One in six struggling right now with mental health. Six thousand five hundred and something people committed suicide in two thousand and eighteen. In two thousand and eighteen. Completed. It's, it's scary numbers, and that's why it's so important that we're talking about it today. And then you talked about um, we should need to treat it like we treat physical health. And so we don't hide when we've got a broken arm. We don't pretend it's not broken. No. We don't try and set it ourselves, or you know, we go and get help. We go and see the surgeon, and he resets it, and we pray, but we also get help. Yeah. And that's really important. And then you were just talking about the simple signs that yeah. something's not right yeah. as well for depression. So. Yeah. Things like you got no energy for the day or you can't get up, struggling to eat, no joy in the things you normally find joy. And those are warning signs. It's the, it's the self-awareness that Brendan was yeah. sort of highlighting for us earlier. It's so helpful, isn't it, just to have it spelled out simply for us um, in that way. I really appreciate you, you sharing like that. Uh, Adam, can I just say this? I, I, and it's not, just, it's, it's not just adults, you know. Uh, statistics have shown that even mental health problems, 50% of mental health problems begin from the, even as small as the age of 12. People go through childhood traumas. People go through things when they were young or younger, but because we've buried it, I've got patients who at 75, 80, come to me and tell me about traumatic experience which they've had as a child, now coming into the forefront. And why is that? Because in their busy adult life, they have things that are like scaffolding for them that distract them away from those traumas. But when those scaffoldings have been taken, when they retire, when their mind is now, you know, occupied with those things, it then brings into forefront all those challenges that you've had in the past. And you see people at those times you know, struggling with their emotions, contemplating suicide is not a good place to, to be, to be honest. 
You know, and we must acknowledge it doesn't matter if you are a pastor, it doesn't matter if you are a clergy, it doesn't matter if you are highly placed in the community, it doesn't matter if you're lowly placed, it doesn't matter if you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're a child, mental health problem can happen to anyone. Yeah. So it can happen to anyone. Yeah, super helpful. So two questions just to finish us off. Yeah. Um, you know, I've asked Lucy, you know, if people are here today thinking maybe something wrong with their mental health, what would you say to them? Obviously, we've heard Lucy's answer, which yeah. I hope you probably agree with. Yeah. I, I kind of did check it in advance. Is there anything else you would say to people in that boat this morning? Yeah. Um, what I would say is seek for help in the right place. Um, there are medical intervention and there are non-pharmacological intervention, things like talking therapy that we can avail ourselves of the opportunity of. Um, when people are struggling, we have in the NHS service, we have uh, talking therapies, uh, what we call high apt. Some of you must have heard of that before. That's integrated um, access to psychological therapy, which you can actually self-refer to, you know, uh, and there are medication out there. The fact that we're Christians doesn't mean that we can not take medication. If we can take medication for physical health issues, we can also take medication for mental health issues, you know, and these medications are quite important. They work. And I can tell you from the experience, they do work, you know, uh, Try this, there are a lot of evidence to show that these medications do work. So don't let us shy away from them. You know, uh, there are support groups out there that we can avail ourselves of, of, of opportunity of. Uh, so feel free to talk to people uh, who can really signpost you to these areas so that we can get help at the right time. Because once you can get help at the right time, both medically and non-pharmacologically, it reduces the chances of reoccurrence. Because people can have recurrent mental health issues, but once you can be able to tackle things on time, then it reduces the chances of reoccurrence and reduces uh, your, the period of your recovery. Because the longer we suffer in silence, the longer the time it will take to recover. But as children of God, we have opportunity. And uh, this is a good place to be, the family of God. I'm telling you, this is a good place to be. Because uh, from surveys done in America, I'm talking about America now, surveys done in America shows that uh, spirituality and religion has a positive role to play in mental health issue, both for our physical health and our mental health, you know. And as children of God, God has said to us that he has not given us the spirit of bondage to fear. He said he's given us the, the spirit of love, which we can find here, of power and of sound mind. And I pray that that will be our portion in the mighty name of Jesus. Excellent. Amen. And I'm going to get you to pray for us in a minute, Akin. I've got one final question, which is we've talked about if, if people are uh, concerned about their own mental health, but for many, you know, maybe five in six of the room, it isn't their own mental health, but the mental health of a loved one, maybe a family member or a friend. And, and so my question is, how can we best help those around us who are struggling with mental health challenges? We can act as scaffolding support for them. Um, let's see the challenges that they are going through as real. The fact that they don't have a broken leg, they are not suffering with high blood pressure, they are not suffering with cancerous conditions, but this thing is in their mind. The fact that it's in their mind that we cannot see does not mean that it's not real. They are going through this suffering and it is real. 
It is really real. So let's be there to support them in their journey as a family of God. To support them in their journey, being by their side, in prayers. And be self-aware also to know when to signpost them to the right places where they can get help from. To signpost them to the right places where they can get help from in timely version. And that will go a long way to help them. You know, uh, let's not be judgmental. Again, let's not be judgmental. You know, uh, see this thing as real that they are going through and help them, you know, uh, encourage them because people that are going through mental health issues, sometimes they don't want to engage with services, but let's encourage them to get that help as at when necessary. And that's all I would say. That's really helpful. Thank you. I mean, I'm so aware that this morning we've scratched the surface, that there's so much else we could have talked about. Even a few of your answers, Aki, and I'm pulling back from getting you to develop them because we will run out of time. And Really, our heart this morning is that we would start the conversation, we would raise the issue, that we'd be aware. I'm sure we'll talk about this again, and I'd encourage you, you know, let's be people who talk about this with one another, whether we're struggling or whether we're okay, but those we know are struggling. I think it's so helpful to hear from those who have expertise and those who have journeyed it as well. Uh, and so can we put our hands together for, for Akin and for, for Lucy and for Brendan? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Church. I've, um, I've asked Akin if he would pray for us, and we're going to finish with uh, some worship. So, Ban, do you want to come back up and get ready to lead us? I think it's great to have information, and it's, you know, we've heard a lot this morning. I'm sure there's all sorts for us to process. Um, but my prayer for this morning has been that God would soften our hearts and make us aware of this topic afresh. But more than that, my prayer has been that we would encounter him afresh in this situation. So for those of you struggling this morning, you're the one in six struggling with mental health challenges and struggles. My prayer is that you would encounter God in it again this morning. For those of us who even perhaps acknowledging that mental health is real this morning, to have heard that from an expert, um, for us not just to get that information, but to now worship God and to be with him uh, in the context of that is so important. So um, we're going to sing a couple of songs. If you feel like you've got contributions, I'm sure Pete and Ruth would love to hear from them. But Akin, why don't you pray for us as a church family, and then we'll, we'll hand over to Sandra to lead us in worship. Can I just encourage each and every one of us to just stand up, please, if we can. Father, we thank you. Lord, we just give you praise. We give you adoration because you are God. You are the one that first loved us, even while we are yet sinners. As your word has said, you have not given us the spirit of bondage to fear, but of love, of power, and of sound mind. I pray for everyone going through mental health challenges here, or have loved ones that are going through mental health challenges. I pray that your love transcends true in our hearts in the mighty name of jesus you said to us that when we go through the fire it will not kindle us he said when we go through the waters it will not overflow us this is your promise for us lord help us to know this all the days of our lives that when we go through these challenges you are there with us because your word tells us that you are our strengths Without you, we cannot do anything. We trust in you. We hope in you. You've been our help in ages past. You are hope for years to come. Lord, grant unto your children that peace that we need, even as we go through those trials. In the name of God the Father, in the name of God the Son, and in the name of God the Holy Spirit. Lord, you said you sent your word and you heal us of all our diseases including infirmities, including mental health issues. Lord, let your word come, comfort us all the days of our lives in the name of Jesus. Let us be entrenched in the fact that you love us. 
despite our difficulties, despite our challenges, and you are able to see us through those challenges. Daddy, we thank you. We give you praise. As a result of what has happened and what is happening through this lament series, Lord, let testimony abound of your faithfulness, of your love, of your kindness in our lives, to our environment, to this nation. In Jesus' precious mighty name, we have prayed. Hallelujah.